Today's episode is brought to you by West End, South Australia's most iconic beer. Now, it's a clean, fresh draft beer. There's nothing more local, nothing more South Australian than cracking a red tin. How do you do what many others won't? Well, you get a doctor who says... <laughs> You know, I'm a little bit more intelligent and uh, yeah. I've got greater tenacity and I've got more skill and I think I just took out that gym yeah. because I'm a great surgeon. Yeah. Oh, my God. Your colleagues are going to listen to that and go, yeah, we're going to destroy you. Well, Dr. Charlie Teo is renowned for performing complex and intricate brain surgeries that others have called inoperable. There's no doubt that he's ruffled feathers amongst the medical profession. The New South Wales medical regulator has slapped strict conditions on him, which has stopped Charlie from doing the one thing he loves, helping people here in Australia. He is one of a kind. He's a true pioneer in one of the most demanding and important fields on the planet, neurosurgery. In this chat, he's raw, he's unfiltered, and he's vulnerable as he shares his views and experiences about being given the privilege and right to operate on the human brain. I hope you enjoy the chat. Now, this episode does talk about mental health, so if you have any concerns, please contact Lifeline on 13 11 14. Rightio, let's go. Welcome along to The Soda Room, a place where we get to know the real stories behind some of the biggest names in the game. It was like we had won the grand final. I just got some new boots. It was something yeah. special for me. Did you understand the significance of that moment? Oh, yeah. Nothing compared. That's what I thought I had to do as a leader. you got the same undies on. <laughs> I've got exactly the same ones on. Charlie Teo, welcome along to what we call The Soda Room. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. It is a, a judgment-free zone where we just come and share stories, and I'm absolutely fascinated by your story, so I really appreciate you being here to do it. It's a pleasure. Um, now, the first thing is, as obviously a world-class neurosurgeon, the one thing I'm surprised is that you're not wearing gloves. Ah. Didn't like George Costanza <laughs> when he was a hand model. I thought you'd be coming in with some oh, nice sort of leather gloves to protect the hands. I actually do have insurance for my hands. You, do you so, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're my livelihood. And you Absolutely. Can't, you can't get anyone else to do it. So it's, yeah. I yeah. thought you would have to. So you've actually have to go and get a policy done and yeah. all that sort of stuff done really on your hands. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you not do certain things because you need to make sure that they... No, no, I still ride a motorbike yep. pretty fast and I, uh, you know, work in the garden and I'm often tearing things up and getting splinters and stuff, so... Surely the insurance company, when they know that you're riding a motorbike, put your policy up? No, there's a few sports that they exclude. They don't like yep. mountain climbing, for example. Okay. They don't like wind... Uh, um, uh, hang gliding. Hang gliding. They don't like hang gliding, but they didn't, they didn't include motorbike riding. Okay, well, that's yeah. all right. You wear yeah. gloves anyway when you motorbike riding, yeah, don't you? Yeah, yeah Which is good. Now, the other thing, Charlie, before we get into this too, you're a um, Christmas Eve baby, aren't you? I am. What time did you arrive? 11.55. Evening? Yes. No, really? It's a really good story, actually, because my mum and dad weren't very wealthy. Yeah. And it was at King George V Hospital in Sydney where mm. the first baby to be born on Christmas Day would get a hamper. Right. And it wasn't a hamper like a, a few lollies and stuff. It was a hamper with white goods and all sorts oh, of things. Oh, right. Yeah, it was yeah, a decent really- Decent stuff. Decent stuff. And so they wanted to, they wanted me to wait until 12.01 or, you of know, course. 12 midnight, but I just was in such a hurry to get out that I came- you know, she was trying to hold me back, hold me back, hold me back, and couldn't hold me back any longer. Was it a long labour, are you aware? Or? Uh, no, it was a short labour. Right. Yeah. So you see, she just had to keep the legs crossed for a little bit longer, Charlie. You would have got a new washing machine. I know. I know. How bad is that? <laughs> it's indicative of my personality, she says, because, yeah, I'm, I'm always in a hurry to do something. When you have a birthday on Christmas Eve, one of my best mates is birthdays on Christmas Eve, you don't get as many presents, do you? Don't they just double them all up? It's terrible. You're no, off. No, not only don't you get presents, but remember, it's always during school holidays. Yeah. So you don't get a party. You don't get yeah. anyone coming around. Uh, even my own daughters uh, forget it. My wife used to forget it. And I'd, I'd forget it sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> and then when you do remember, it's like, oh, this is your Christmas birthday present. You know, like yeah. Both, yeah. You get yeah. the double. I want to know, when you talk to someone, and I do this all the time, and you're saying to someone about they've got some issues or they're worried about their work, we always use the old, it's not brain surgery. <laughs> Charlie, I can't use that with you because it actually is, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> but you can use, you're not a rocket scientist. Well, are brain surgeons 
at a higher level than rocket science, oh, or you two are the only on the no, only no, no. two occupations on the same level at the top. No, rock, rock, rocket science falls into insignificance when it comes to <laughs> brain surgery. <laughs> We're at the top of the pecking order. Well, you <laughs> are. You are. It is such a unique occupation. Tell me, how do you get into brain surgery? Why was that what you chose, or did it choose you? No, I actually didn't choose it because it, the fact that it was at the top of the pecking order. I knew how physically and mm-hmm. emotionally taxing it was. I knew that a lot of patients died. I knew that it was unforgiving. You make a mistake and someone dies or loses their arm or leg or their sight or their language. And so that's, that was the sort of pressure that I felt that I would not be able to handle. So I mm. actually chose not to do neurosurgery. Mm. And uh, it wasn't until I was actually thrust into it uh, without any uh, volunteerism. I, I, I didn't want to do it. Mm. And then I realized it was uh, incredibly stimulating and a very young specialty in which I could still be a pioneer because uh, there's so much that's unknown about the brain, even to mm. the, today, there's so mm. much that's unknown about the brain. It gives you the ability to come up with you know, new ideas and new discoveries. How demanding is it to get through not just medical school, but then to do the surgery and all this sort of stuff? I mean, given the, the right to operate on someone's brain, it feels like a, it's a pretty big license. Yeah. No, I'm glad you said that because it is a right. I mean, people trust their lives mm. in your hands. They put mm. their lives, their functionality, their independence, their personality in your hands. And uh, that's something I'll never, ever take for granted. And I'll never, ever sort of uh, disrespect a patient uh, mm. for that uh, amazing uh, sort of trust in someone. Uh, so I'll always sort of uh, make sure I appreciate that trust uh, when I operate on them. How demanding is the process to get the tick of approval, to give us a bit of an understanding, like uh, X amount of years in medical school and what well, do you actually have to do to be? The honest truth is you don't have to be the smartest, you know, or the sharpest mm. uh, tool in the shed. Uh, there are other qualities that I certainly look for in a trainee uh, that I think are way more important than intelligence, for example. Kindness is mm. one. Uh, tenacity is another. Yeah, so dogged perseverance, that's what you really need Mm. because, you know, certainly with what I do, I do really difficult brain tumours and oftentimes they are very bloody, uh, very complicated and in order to take them out, you just need sheer tenacity. You just need to keep going and going and going uh, when others might stop. Mm. So I look for someone who has the ability to focus, not to be distracted, have perseverance, a kindness, compassion. I think those qualities are more important, or certainly as important, mm. if not more important than intelligence, for example. Is it true when you were younger, did you used to practice putting the biro back into the holder without touching the sides, a bit like that operation game would have played as kids? Yeah. There was a series on TV called Dr. Kildare. Yeah. And Dr. Kildare was a dashing, sort of handsome, uh, debonair, doctor who would save lives and uh, he, when they showed him operating, he had you know, no tremor, uh, very still demeanor about him. And uh, yeah, so I would, I would think, gee, I wonder if I could be a Dr. Kildare. I wonder if I could be a brain surgeon. So I used to take the inside of a biro pen yeah. and see if I could insert it into, uh, <laughs> uh, into the uh, hard shell without touching the edges, uh, even before those games came around. Before operation? No, no, I did it as a child. No, as a no, kid. before Operation the Game. That ga- yeah, you know, before that game. Operation the Game so came out. So you could have actually invented that. I could have, you know. Because you were doing yeah. that at home with doing your biros. With a biro, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How young were you when you were doing that? I remember doing it before I went to boarding school. So that means I must have been eight, yeah, seven or eight. So was the idea of becoming a doctor in your head at that stage? No, no, no. I, uh, it was only because it was driven by Dr. Kildare on yeah. TV. Yeah. But I knew that I wanted to do something with my hands. I was right. always... Like I was a Lego champion. Yeah, right. I was a local Lego champion. What, what, what is a Lego champion? What did you have to do to win that title? So they had uh, a local champion. So you, yeah. you went to the – it was held at the f- local pharmacy or something. Yeah. And uh, so you compete with the kids in your area. Yeah. And then if you won that, you went to the suburb, the right. suburban championships. Yep. And then if you won that, you went to uh, Sydney. Right. If you went, won that, you'd go to New South Wales. And then if you won that, you'd compete nationally. Right. And I was on the uh, 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 state 
championships yeah. uh, as a little Chinese boy <laughs> and all the others were teenage white boys. And it was on Reggie Rock, Reggie Rocker on Channel Seven or some program on Channel Channel right. Seven where they had this competition. Yeah. The funny story is that uh, I, you know, he was this little Chinese guy uh, with all these older, uh, more mature kids mm-hmm. building pretty fancy stuff, and they go, "Go, it's timed as well." Yep. And so I was doing very, very well, and the camera was coming around saying, "Yes, and here's Charlie Teo from <laughs> Panania Picnic Point, doing you know extremely well. He looks like he's building a very complicated house." And uh, then they had a break, and they brought out donuts and Coca Cola. Okay, <laughs> now my mother never exposed us to Coca Cola, lollies, sugar, oh. uh, or donuts, and so I started eating them. And apparently uh, <laughs> then the bell goes to start again and all the others get back into their building and I'm still stuffing my face with donuts and Coca-Cola and my <laughs> mum and dad are in the wings of the stage going, stop eating, stop eating, you know, like, start constructing again. And uh, I lost. I lost mostly because I just spent the entire time eating co- uh, eating donuts yeah. and drinking Coca-Cola. I would yeah. imagine that the dexterity in the hands with that much sugar in the body when you weren't used to it, you probably were struggling to hold the I leg might up, been. I might have been. I might have You keep the Coke and the donuts away from the operating theatre. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, no, no. That's a, that's a good point. I, I make sure my fellows and my trainees yeah. don't drink coffee before surgery because that coffee is enough to give you a, a fine tremor under the microscope. Is that right? So, oh, yeah. I insist that they're in peak physical condition yes. uh, before they do an operation, and that means no coffee. Yeah. yeah. I, I want to ask too then, obviously, you, you go through all of your, your training and so forth, and imagine it's it's unbelievably challenging. It's just an enormous dedication. It's pretty much take over your whole life for that period of time. Well, look, people say that, and it is long hours, but when you're doing something that you love, it really, mm. uh, I mean, it was the love of my life. Mm. I mean, as soon as I got into neurosurgery, I, I knew that it was my passion. I didn't want mm. to do anything else. Mm. Uh, I would, uh, I, to this day, Mark, if I'm on holidays, I yearn to get back to work. Really? Yeah, I do. That's a bloody good thing. Yeah. and And then- I can also tell you something else. There's a paper that came out out of England that showed that if you're a surgeon who retired at 60, you live an average of 19 years. Yep. If you're a surgeon who retires at 65, you only live an average of four years. Why? It's the stress and all that kind of stuff that the body is, once it gets, the body gets too old, you can't handle that stress. Right. But the point is that I knew that paper. Someone alerted me to that paper, and yep. I knew that I wanted to live, you know, nineteen years, not four years. Yeah. So I was going to retire at sixty, and uh, and in fact, I even said publicly I'd probably retire at sixty. But when sixty came along, and I, the very thought of retiring, I just couldn't handle. I just love it too much. You're sixty four now, aren't you? I'm sixty four now. Soon to so be sixty five. If you get to sixty five. No. Hang on. We, if you I, look I, at that I'm, paper, we can't worry about that paper now. No, I just love it too much. It's, it's what I was born to do and I'm good at it and I still get results that no one else gets and I still take out tumours that no one else will take out. And so uh, Beyond just having more experience, are you a better surgeon now than you were at 55? Outside of the experience, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Is there something that you sort of develop in that time beyond experience that uh, it can make you even better at your job? No, no. They say that a surgeon reaches their peak at 45 to 55. Mm. After that, you start deteriorating in terms of your vision. People get a senile tremor. Uh, You lose testosterone, so you lose courage. And so 45 to 55 is your peak as a surgeon. Mm. The reason I think I'm better now, and I think Mm. I really do, I I mean, I did a tumour just a few weeks ago, and I thought to myself, gee, I wouldn't have been able to do that with the same results a few years ago, uh, it's experience. Yeah. You can't beat experience. Mm. Just can't beat mm. it. You can't teach those things. Mm. Uh, you don't read those things in books. You know, how hard you can pull on the blood vessel before it tears, for example. Mm. I mean, how do you mm. teach that? Mm. It's only through trial and error, unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. Uh, where you t- pull too hard, the vessel tears, and then you realise, shit, I can't pull you that can't hard. can't go that hard. Yeah. God. Experience uh, counts for the most, I think. Yeah. Obviously, with what you're doing is such an amazing level and it has such huge consequences, positive and negative. When I think of all of that, you finally get the chance when you get a tick of approval to be on your own and be completely responsible for operations, I imagine, after thousands of hours. Do you feel confident when you first do that? or Do you have doubts or are those doubts removed through training? 
No, they're not removed through training. I'm telling you right now, because through training, even when you're a good surgeon and your boss identifies you as a good surgeon, just the fact that he's in the room mm. or he's on call or he the buck stops with him, mm. he's taking responsibility for the operation, is enough to calm you down and give you a lot of confidence. Once you lose that and the buck stops with you, mm. there's no one else around, uh, you can't call on anyone, uh, if things go bad, it's your fault, no one else's, that delivers a whole new layer of uh, anxiety, mm. uh, stress, and complexity to your opera on, to your operation. And so when I did my first operation as an attending, all the responsibility was mine. I can remember sweating and fogging up my glasses mm. and thinking, oh my God, you know, I've got no uh, person to call on. Uh, yeah. It's me. Yes. Some people always have, and I've had this before in my work, that sort of imposter syndrome, like oh, maybe I'm not good enough. I can't believe they're letting me do this or whatever it might be. You can't be a neurosurgeon and have that, type of feeling, can you? Oh, that's a whole discussion in itself. The, mm. You know, the discussion is, uh, where's the line between arrogance and confidence? Yep. And I do a lot of soul searching about that because, you know, I think I'm really good mm. and I get great results. But when I get a bad result, you've got to think to yourself, shit, was I being arrogant to think that I could do that? Or was I just confident? Or, I mean... Uh, there's a very, very fine line between that, you know, because if you're not, com if you, you get a bad outcome and you let it affect you, in other words, you think, shit, I'm not good enough, mm. then, you know, it's going to affect either, well, it may not, may stop you from doing that case again, yep. or it may stop you from pushing the envelope even mm. further or challenging yourself mm. even further. Conversely, if you think to yourself, well, you know, I'm really good and that happened mm -hmm. just because shit happens and it's the patient's anatomy and the pathology of the tumour, it wasn't me, then you're never going to learn from your mistakes. Mm. And so that line between arrogance and confidence, I'm telling you, we walk that line every day. So self-reflection is a big part of what you do all the time. Self-reflection and reflection auditing so that yep. you can get independent assessors to look at just figures and go, Charlie, you're having yourself on there. Mm. Or uh, you know you t you're biting off too much more more than you can chew, or so it's good to have that self reflection yep. and uh, and input from yep. others. I've often heard the term you know people saying that uh, someone who has the responsibilities you have, and I'm not saying this to you at all, but the whole thing of a god complex. Does that exist in some people that do the sort of things you do? Oh my god, yes. Is it common? Yes, in it's your, very common. It is, yeah. Yeah, you've got to actually snap yourself out of it. I mean, have you yourself got to that point where you, I don't, you know, not in no, no. you have, or, but. You'd be, uh, I think you, you'd be lying if you said you never got that god complex. I got it. Yeah. I'll tell you when I got it. Yeah. I used to judge other people's risk appetite according to my own. Right. Okay. So someone comes in. So I did a TED, TEDx talk on this and, yep. and I really, I'm really proud of myself for doing it because I think everyone should. Watch it. <laughs> okay. So this lady comes in, she's quadriplegic. Mm -hmm. She's got a big tumor right mm. between her brain and the spinal cord that they called inoperable at some other hospital eight years previously. Mm. So she accepts their decision and she doesn't get it operated on and she becomes quadriplegic and her only function is the ability to talk and breathe. Yep. She can't do anything else. So she comes to me and says, I want you to take the tumor out. And I go, well, it's actually the sort of tumor I can take out. It's also benign. And if I take it out, you're going to live. She goes, mm. great. I go, well, you can't walk. You can't scratch your nose. Mm -hmm. Your quality of life is pretty poor. Mm. Are you really sure you want me to do this? Oh, my God. Mark. You judged, I judged her quality of life on your quality of life thought. based on my idea of what quality yeah. of life was. I was playing God. I understand what you mean. I was playing God. And she goes, how dare you tell me what my quality of life is? I have two 16-year-old twins, yep. and my quality of life is to be able to impart my wisdom and my knowledge to those girls. Quality of life to me is the mm. ability to talk mm. and impart wisdom. Mm. I don't mm. have to walk on the beach or scratch my nose. Yeah. And then I realized, Jeez. I realized then that, you know, here am I projecting my ideas of quality of life onto someone else who may have something completely different in terms yep. of what their ambitions are and their goals are and their yeah. quality of life is. And 
you know, doctors do that all the time. I hate to say it, but my colleagues, as well as myself, at some, yeah. I don't do it anymore, of course. Yeah. But we project our opinion, and that's yeah. you know, when a when a doctor calls a tumor inoperable, for example. Mm. I really find that terrible because there's no such thing as inoperable. You can cut out any tumor. Yeah. You can cut out half the brain if you wanted to. Yeah. It's risk benefit ratio. Yep. So what they should be saying to the patient is, look, here's the risks of the operation. Here's the benefits. It's your duty to tell me if the risk benefit ratio is acceptable. My job is to give you the truth and, and the facts. Here's the risk. Here's the benefits. You choose now, is the risk-benefit ratio something that you're happy to accept? For some of those uh, operations that others will not take on, but the, uh, the patient does want them to, shouldn't they be responsible to actually do the operation if that person actually wants it to happen? Well, I think so. If you listen to my TED Talk, I, you yeah. know, you would. Yeah. But no, 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 <laughs> no. Medical governing bodies now... Mm are very centered on evidence-based medicine. Mm -hmm. So here's the worst thing about evidence-based medicine. It says that you shouldn't do an operation unless there's evidence to prove that you should do the operation. Yep. And if there's no evidence, you're sticking your neck out, you're at risk of litigation, you're at risk of con mm -hmm. condemnation by your colleagues if you did something against EBM. Right. Well, my point is, how in the hell are you going to get evidence to support the operation unless someone yes. goes out and does it first? Mm to prove that it, uh, that it might work. Well, nothing would change in the world. Nothing would Not change. Not just neurosurgery. Nothing yeah. would change if people didn't do something for the first time. Yeah. Just with that, and you're talking about uh, doing these unbelievably uh, detailed operations that can take hours and hours and hours. Now, I, I believe your longest operation, was it 26 hours? Yeah, I was a fellow. In other words, I was training in pediatric neurosurgery in Dallas, in uh, Dallas, Texas. Mm. No, it wasn't. No. No, I was in Little Rock, Arkansas. So I must have been a young attending. And so I just graduated my first year as a, uh, a faculty, and that was in Little Rock, Arkansas. And it was a 16 year old African American girl with a, a thing called an arterial venous malformation that was both above and below the tent. In other words, it was right in the middle of the brain, uh, affecting not only the brain stem, the important part of the brain, but also the other. Uh, parts of the brain that mm. uh, affect not any movement, but mm. uh, cognitive function, et cetera, et cetera. And so it was incredibly sensitive around sensitive areas. It was big. Uh, it was incredibly involved. Yeah, you have to coagulate and cut every little blood vessel in this thousands and thousands of blood vessels that are extremely fragile. And you've got to do each vessel. Each vessel. If you try and rush it, you tear the vessels or they rupture. And then you lose control, and then it takes you probably 10 times longer to get that control, and hence the importance of taking it really slowly, coagulating every vessel one by one. And coagulating? And for, burning, yeah. yeah. And it took how long? 26 hours. Now, I'm trying to get my she head around. Well. So Con the, well, one, concentrating for that long, because you, you can't let your mind wander <laughs> when most of us are sitting at work and start daydreaming. You right. can't daydream. No. Not only have you got that uh, intellectual and I imagine emotional strain, you've got this physical strain because you're standing upright, concentrating, making sure your hands aren't yes. moving beyond what they need to do. I, how do you do that? I have this great ability to do it. You know, my good friend is Steve Waugh, you know, the cricketer. Yeah. Yep. And Steve was at the beach with me one day and there was this fishing line that was all tangled up. And I, I don't know, maybe I'd spent an hour and a half trying to untangle it. And Steve looked at me and goes, Oh my God, you're still at, you know, he couldn't believe that I was still focused and he goes, that's why you're a good neurosurgeon. And uh, I, didn't real, I didn't actually realize until he pointed it out that I had this amazing ability to concentrate and stay focused on something for a long, long time. So for 26 hours, pretty much straight, or did you, you have a break in that yeah, short that, look, break or something, didn't you late in the day? Remember, that is the longest operation I've ever done. Of course. Done. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I do operations anywhere between 10 and 18 hours on a pretty regular basis. Well, let's even say 10, because 10 is a long bloody time, yeah, 10 hours. It so is. if you look at 10 hours, do you eat during that time? Do you go to the toilet during that time? Do you do you no. get a breather? No, 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 no. And again, please don't think that I'm some sort of superhuman. You just get very used to it, and the yep. body adapts to it as well. Like you would think that after 26 hours, you'd have to go to the toilet. 
I mean, well, she, I would. Yeah. <laughs> no, but for some reason, the body can concentrate the urine. After that 26 hour operation, I took a break at 12 midnight. Yep. So that's 16 hours of operating, not going to the toilet, not eating, not drinking, nothing. No break. No break. No break. I take a break at midnight and I remember going to the toilet and, and doing a wee. Yep. And it was like doing a wee with molasses. It came out like, oh, oh my God, it was painful and it was really, really concentrated. I thought, how, the, how does the body know yep. that I was going to not be able to pee for uh, 16 hours? But anyway, it does. And then, yeah, then I, I had a, a, an ice cream and I was about to lie down and have a rest and the person who took over, my boss, got yep. into a lot of trouble, uh, too much bleeding, so called for me to come back again and I completed it uh, over, the next, uh, over the next nine hours. Yeah. I find that just amazing it, it, that you, but like you said, you, your body adapts to what you need to do, doesn't it? And your mind adapts to what you need to do. But it is quite bizarre. It seems completely unnatural to be it able does. to do that for such a long period and continuously. Yeah. Well, some people can't do it. I mean, mm. you know, if you're fat mm. or if you're unfit uh, yeah. or you're not in good physical condition, you, you find it very hard to do. Mm. But I think it's, look, a lot of neurosurgeons are going to be out there listening and thinking, oh, my God, the arrogant prick. But I think it's incumbent on us to give our patients the very best that we can give them. Mm. And if that means being fit and healthy and have you know tenacity, then so be it. So I think it's incumbent on me to, to stay fit and healthy mm. so that I can do those long operations yep. without rushing it or without sort of losing concentration. Yeah. Charlie, you've become world renowned because you will take on those unbelievably challenging jobs and a lot of the ones that uh, other surgeons will say are inoperable. Yes. How can you and why can you do it? Are you more skilled? Are you more confident? Do you have more courage? How do you do what many others won't? Look, I don't. The, the worst thing about being a doctor is that everyone wants you to eat humble pie. Mm. I've heard sportsmen on TV going when the commentator says, you know, you did a, you played a good game there. You know, what was it? Do you think that, you know, how, how did you mm. beat your component? And they go, well, you know, I, I was in peak physical condition and I played a great game and I was, I had focus and, uh, you know, I think I was a better player on the day. Mm. Well, you get a doctor who says, <laughs> you know, I'm a little bit more intelligent and I've yeah. got greater tenacity and I've got more skill and I think I just took out that gym yeah. because I'm a great surgeon. Yep. Oh, my God. They're going to say wanker straight away, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, wanker. Not only wanker, but your colleagues are going to listen to that and go, we're going to destroy you. And uh, I think that's part of my problem. You know, part of my problem is that I haven't been a wilting flower. I haven't said yep. that, you know, it's, that it's uh, pure luck. Or, you know, mm. I think I'm a great surgeon. Mm. I think I've got this amazing ability to take out tumors that other people can't take out, mm. uh, be it tenacity, mm. uh, 3D perception, a, a still hand, mm -hmm. no tremor. Mm. I don't know what it is. Mm. Courage. You know, it's probably a combination of all those things yep. because I've seen other doctors who are technically better than me. Yep. I've seen other doctors who have amazing dexterity or 3D perception, mm. way better than mine. Mm. But, but, you know, you've got to have that combination of courage, tenacity, skill, experience, knowledge, 3D perception, you know, all mm. of those things. Mm. If you get a patient who is in, a, obviously has brain cancer and they say, I want you to do whatever you can, would you always do an operation or is there times when you'd say, you know what, it, it, there's actually no point in me operating? It's more complicated than that. And yeah. a lot of the problems that I've had with my critics has been because I haven't been in that room right. having that discussion. Yep. And that discussion is, oh, what's the word I'd like to use? It's, it's multifaceted. And what I mean by that is that you've got to – Okay. Okay. By way of example, yeah. when a neurosurgeon comes to train with me, I get them to see a patient and then present that patient to me. Mm. And so often the doctors come and go, this is a 36 year old man who presents with a three month history mm. of, mm. and I go, stop right there. Medical jargon talk. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. I want to know who that patient is. Yep. So I want to know what they do for a living. 
Mm. I want to know their social circumstances, who supports them, what their hobbies are. I want to know their appetite, risk, uh, their appetite for risk. Yep. I want to know, and that can be told to me by, you know, are they extreme sportsmen? Mm -hmm. Are they, you know, mm. how risk averse are they? Yep. I want to know about their quality of life and how they measure their quality of life. Mm. And so, you know, sure, it's one thing telling me that their cranial nerve six doesn't work so well. That's fine. You've got to know that. But mm. I really want to know the person. Yep. And that is part of my decision making where mm. I actually, I, 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 I see it. There's not a tumor in the frontal lobe, but I see it as a, you know, a young guy who's got no social uh, network, who uh, just loves his whole life is physical. And, you know, then you can mm -hmm. go, okay, well, this, this operation can potentially, you know, ruin your ability to be independent and enjoy life because it could potentially paralyze you. And yep. then, so then you've got to start pulling your punches and saying, in my opinion, yep. in my opinion, yeah, yeah. I think this the risk benefit ratio is such that uh, I'm not going to recommend surgery. Right. But then I always go on to say, look, you've got my opinion. I'm not recommending surgery. I think it's too risky for poor yep. benefit. But if you really want it, yep. I'm on your team. You'll do and it. That's what I say to them. I say, look, I'm not recommending it, mm. but I believe in patient autonomy. Mm. I, I believe that you should respect the wishes of your patient. Mm. And as long as they're well informed. Yep. Now, again, a lot of my critics go, oh, that's all well and good, Charlie, but you can always sway someone uh, one way or the other. And it's absolutely true. You can. Mm. You can make it sound really risky or not risky, and you can influence someone's decision making. Yep. So they're absolutely right. It's really important. It's incumbent on the doctor to be honest mm -hmm. and to be as objective as possible in their informed consent. Yep. And then mm. you can allow the patient to make the, make the decision. So, Charlie, there are instances where you will not operate, even if a client or a patient says, oh, look, I want you to do it? Yes. It happens rarely. Mm. But, of course, there are some tumors that you, re you know full well that the risk-benefit ratio isn't even a ratio. It's, mm. there's, there's no benefit and there's all risk. Right. And so, yes, yeah, so there's a tumor called a DIPG, for example, mm -hmm. otherwise known as diffuse midline glioma mm -hmm. or diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma. It's a tumor where the brain itself is interspersed amongst the tumor. And right. it's not separate. It's not as if the tumor is gotcha. pushing against normal brain. It is totally- Part of the tissue almost? Is that yeah, it's, it's, almost of... like, it's almost like sugar crystals in a salt right. bowl. And so- it's impossible to take out. Yep. And I have a lot of those patients with DIPGs coming to me and saying, you know, we understand you're a brainstem mm. surgeon and you take out brainstem tumors that others don't take out. Please, can you take out this tumor? Yep. And I say to them, absolutely not. I, mm. I won't do it. I won't do it because there's no benefit. Mm. Oh, well, the, actually, that's not true. The benefit is to get tissue out so you can look at it under the microscope, but no benefit to the patient. Yep. And uh, so that's an mm. emphatic no. Mm. However, there are other brainstem tumors that kind of look like DIPGs, but they're not. They're actually very extensive focal tumors in the brainstem, and yeah. they're almost as risky, but they're not quite as risky. In other words, there is some benefit in taking yeah. them out. You can yeah. either cure someone, buy them time, mm. et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And they're the difficult ones. They're the ones where I go, mm, gee, you've got a normal child at the moment. Uh, surgery on this tumor is going to put them in an ICU, on a ventilator for a while. It may even be malignant. In other words, they might die in a year's mm. time anyway. Mm. I guess, in my opinion, there's about a 5% chance of a good outcome. Yeah. And if you're honest with them like that and they still want to go ahead with the surgery yep. and you know the child's going to die anyway, mm. then sure, I'll do those cases. And mm. that's where I give the patient the uh, the, the, the ability to, mm. to choose. I think it's... Well, not, not so much my responsibility, but what I say to them is, look, I'm not recommending this. I think it's too risky. Yeah. If you saw my TEDx talk about the child I operated in Singapore, for example, I actually said that to the mother. Mm -hmm. I go, it's way too risky. Everyone else has called it inoperable. I think there's probably only a 1% to 5% chance that it could be a good outcome. I'm not recommending surgery, but if you want me to do it, mm. I'll give it a shot. And yep. she was dying. She would have died in the next few days. Yeah. And it turned out to be the mother made the right decision. It was a curable tumor. I got it all out. The kid's alive today. Really? Yes. 
Gee. And and if she'd listened to me, wow. if she'd listened to me, that child would have died, a, you know, Is within right? a week. Yeah. And again, for those people out there who are so critical of me, you're not in that room. Mm. The the complexity of that consent process is is something that you just cannot. It's body language. It's mm. assessing who they are. That you know, and 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 being honest with them and forthright, and then them being honest and forthright with you. It's a it's an amazing consultation mm. process. And I'm still told by surgeons across the world. I was just told recently by a German neurosurgeon who sat in on one of those those consultations and said, Charlie, I still learn stuff off you every time I hear you consent a patient. Mm. That's how complex it is. Mm. So it is a hard decision. Yeah. And it's and it's hard for not only the surgeon, but it's probably even harder for the patient or the loved ones mm. uh, once you give them that information. How stressed do you get with everyday life? Is everything now, because you're making life and death decisions quite often, Yeah. Is the rest of the world and everyday tasks become so mundane to you that they're not that significant? <laughs> Does that make well, sense? Well, it makes a lot of sense. That's the good and the bad of dealing mm. with di- life and death. The mm. good is that it puts things in perspective, and you yep. don't and you don't uh, sweat the small things. Yes. But the bad thing is that people around you aren't in that situation, and, and sometimes you don't appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Does that make things difficult? I imagine it would in a whole range of different areas. Oh my it? god! In relationships, it makes it incredibly difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, you know you're meant to show empathy. That would make life very hard around you, wouldn't it? I think for a lot of people yes. around you, because it's like Charlie. Well, I, I need some attention. Yeah, I need some attention. Oh, I need you to show concern. I need some yeah, absolute recognition, or I need yeah. you to turn around and agree with me that um, you know my bum looks big in these pants, <laughs> or whatever it is. You know that ridiculous question that you. You never ask you, no, your bum looks great in those pants. uh, We know that's the only thing you can ever say. (laughs) The other thing I want to know, do you have doubts? Because you will take on these jobs that a lot of people won't. And I don't mean, I sound like I'm trivialising saying jobs. You'll do these operations that other people won't. Do you have self-doubt in your professional world and decisions that you make? Or are you pretty comfortable that? No, well, look. I get my fair share of bad outcomes, believe me. Mm. I do the world's most difficult tumours, and of course I'm going to have some bad outcomes. I've never said I don't. I never, mm. I've never said I'm perfect. And uh, when I get a bad outcome, of course it hurts me. It hurts me. Uh, you know, Sometimes I cry, I openly sob when I'm by mm. myself thinking, oh, my God, I've ruined that person's life or I've taken that person's speech away or their mm. vision away or their arm away. Or And sometimes you know, you've even taken their all their quality of life away. Mm. And so you've got to live with that, remember. It's so it's something that you can never, ever downplay or you can never forget it. It's stuck with you forever. But here's how I get over it. I, I once had a great mentor when I was a young intern uh, because uh, I was called to a cardiac arrest and the patient died and I, I took the whole responsibility on my own shoulders saying that, you know, if, it, if I had done a better job, this person would have lived. And he pulled me aside and said, Charlie, look, you're obviously in a pretty bad way emotionally. I was crying, I remember. Mm. And he goes, it's not your fault. You've got to understand that you tried your hardest, that this person was going to die anyway mm. if it wasn't for you there. And as long as you tried your best, you should be happy with, with that. Mm. And so as a neurosurgeon, you've got to constantly say to yourself, I tried my best. Mm. As long as you have tried your best. Now, yeah. now the, people who, the people who are doing an operation – for other reasons apart from the patient's best interest, yep. the greater good, yes. then I don't know how they live with themselves, yep. but that is when it's bad. Because yep. if you've done an operation, the outcome's bad, and you go to yourself, look, I did it for because I, I pretended that patient was my daughter mm. and I did it in their best interests, then you can live with yourself. Mm. But if you, ever, you know, if, you, yeah. if you ever couldn't say that to yourself, oh, yep. I, you know, I rushed it. I, uh, I wasn't, uh, I didn't sleep well the night before Mm. I had an argument with the wife and I was, I had a tremor. Mm. Uh, I didn't have the best staff in the room. I did it because I wanted to prove something. I did it because, you know, I need the money. Mm. You know, those are the people who, I don't know how they cope. Mm. Uh, but, uh, but you know, I, I cope and I get over it because I know that even if the outcome is bad, uh, I did it in the patient's best interest. 
uh, which sometimes isn't in the best interest of the family. And that's another point yeah. because, you know, sometimes a patient comes in with a brain tumor, it's been called inoperable. And uh, when you say to them, look, I can take it out for you and it's going to this risk and that risk. And you can see in their eyes that they don't really want to take the risk, but their yep. family going, yes, he wants it out. Yeah. He wants it out. And it's because, and then I sit down and have to go through that whole conversation. Like I go, okay, now everyone stop. Just listen yep. here. Of course you want the tumor out because mm. you can't bear to see your father die. Mm. And you love him so much that you want him to have the operation. Yep. But is it in your father's best interest? Yeah. And so that's a really difficult conversation, but that's a conversation that I have at least probably once or twice a month where mm. there is this disconnect between what the family wants and what the patient wants. And remember, your job is to be the, the patient advocate, mm. not the family advocate. Do they teach psychology to you in medical school? Because it sounds like obviously beyond being a neurosurgeon, you are, you're a psychologist, you're a counsellor, you're all these other things. Do all the doctors have those skills to be no. able to make those decisions? No. Why, why do you think doctors aren't at the top of the most trusted profession anymore? I mean, in the olden days, I think you did pick doc. Oh, look, I, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble saying this, but in the olden days, doctors, were, doctors went into medicine. People went into medicine because they wanted to help people. Yep. That was their major mm. driving force. You know, I want to help people. I want to do medicine. And they could get in because there weren't many, that many altruistic people around. Mm. And it was relatively easy to get into medicine. In fact, there was a time it was, it was difficult to get doctors and they used to recruit barbers and people who were good technicians and stuff. Really? And then, of course, there was a time where you had to be rich to get into medicine, you had to pay, and then oh, there was a the time. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you think about it now, you don't have to have any other skill to get into medicine except for the ability to regurgitate knowledge. So you have to be in the top half percent of the state mm -hmm. in your matriculation exam to get into medicine. So that means that people are getting into medicine without all those other skills like mm -hmm. compassion yep. and kindness and empathy. Uh, and communication skills. They're getting in simply because they're so smart mm. that they've managed to get the marks to get in. I will never forget, I had a babysitter called Lucy. Lucy, if you're out there, you know, I remember, I remember this. She is the kindest, most beautiful person you'll ever meet. Her father got cancer of the pancreas and she cared for him for the six weeks that he had until he died and she showed amazing ability to care mm. and, uh, and be kind. And she wanted to do medicine. Well, she never got the marks. Mm. She would have made the perfect yeah. doctor, but mm. she didn't get the marks because mm. she, you know, she couldn't regurgitate mm. uh, you know, facts. Yep. And, and, yeah. then, and then you get into medicine and guess what? You are penalized. You are downgraded if you question or challenge dogma. Yep. If, if, if the professor comes in and says, you know, A equals B, and you say, well, actually, A mode equals C, mm. you yep. know, you're out. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. you, you fail. So you have people who can regurgitate medicine, uh, knowledge getting into medicine. Yep. You then get a, a profession that encourages regurgitation of dogma mm. and not challenging the status quo. And then you become a doctor where you've got medical governing bodies saying that you can't uh, do anything uh, outside the ordinary. You've got to toe the party line. You've got to get uh, consensus from your colleagues yep. and you've got to uh, get evidence-based medicine. Yep. So you've got this whole vocation now of people who don't want to challenge. Well, if they do, they get penalized for it. So yep. they've been, it's been drummed into them. Don't challenge the status quo. Yep. Don't do anything that's not got evidence to back you up. Uh, and uh, so there's this stagnation of medicine uh, because certainly in this country, mm. uh, stagnation where people aren't challenging the status quo and they're not doing things uh, that are that's, uh, sort of a little bit left field. Well, that sounds to me like someone who's with no real knowledge in that area, though, that you, you don't get change, you don't get evolution, you don't get development, you don't get new techniques created if you can't challenge a conservative establishment. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's... It, 
That's what's what happening. It seems like. Look what's happened to Charlie Teo. You know, y- you be a Charlie Teo, and the message we're going to send out mm. to all those other young doctors is you do what Charlie Teo does, and this is what we're going to do to you. We're going to destroy you. So, look, as many people know, and those that don't listen, the, those that are listening that don't. So, essentially, now the medical board in New South Wales has put these onerous restraints on you because of certain complaints or reasons, so that essentially you can't operate in Australia. The bottom line is almost impossible for you to. It's almost impossible for me to operate in Australia, but it's more complicated than that. Yeah. I could go on for ages and ages. Mm. It's too negative. So I won't talk about it too much, but it goes Mm. like this the system is broken. It's a dysfunctional system whereby a competitor can make a vexatious complaint about you. Mm. You are immediately presumed to be guilty, and then you've got to prove your innocence. To the very person who complained about you. Now, how can that system work? It's like Coles making a complaint about Woolworths, and then Woolworths goes, well, hang on, we clean our floors twice a day. Uh, who's going to judge that? Well, let's get the Coles person to judge that. Yep. It's, it's, so we have been, I am being judged by my competitors who are the very people who made the complaints about me in the first mm. place. How can you have a fair mm. system or due process when you've got that you know, antiquated, Mm. uh, unfair uh, uh, set of rules. So the ability to do what you love doing and which clearly there are thousands and thousands of people have benefited from and and would, you know, provide testimonies for you, if that's removed from you at the moment, how do you you feel? I mean, I don't mean as in I know you're frustrated and all these different things, but how do you cope with that? Because this is who you are, this is what you do, this is what you love. How do you yeah. deal with that mentally? Well, uh, well I, I've never really felt melancholic. I mean, I've been, no, actually, I haven't been sad. I've been angry. Mm. It's mostly anger at the sadness of the situation. Mm. So the sadness of the situation is that my entire practice was mostly taking out tumors that other people called inoperable. So that yep. was 90% of my practice. Mm. That's 10 tumors a week. Mm. So that means quite conceivably that there are nine patients a week who are mm. missing out on either extension of life or cure from a condition that I know that I can help. Now, that's mm. sad. Mm. The good news is that you know, at this moment, I can operate overseas. Uh, the Australian so, rules don't apply to overseas. If you had an Australian patient, you could take them overseas if financially it was viable yeah. that you could operate on them to still do what you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How can you reconcile all of this at the moment? Because it's been taken away from you or made unbelievably difficult. Are you coping okay? I mean, this from a point of view of you as a person. The sad thing is that I'm – Getting a very jaded opinion of humanity. Mm. I mean, that's sad. It'd be it'd be nice to think that most humans are nice people, and there's the occasional evil one. But the more evil that you witness in life, the more you realise, oh, maybe maybe humans are evil, and there is occasionally mm. a good one. So that's sad that I'm thinking that way. Mm. The other thing is, look, I I got to a stage where I was getting palpitations, and I was getting really angry, and and so I went and saw a. a a guru. a guru. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So when I was in India, operating in yeah. India, uh, yeah. I do a lot of charity work in India and do yep. a lot of pro bono work there. And I thought, well, look, you know, Indians, you know, so a lot of people go to India to find themselves and right. you know, they have a great philosophy. So I met with the guru, spent a few days with him. Mm. And, you know, we went through all of this. And I must say that uh, it really made me come out the other end in a better place. And if you want to distill what he taught me, it yeah. was this, Charlie. Uh, one day it'll all make sense. <laughs> it'll, it'll all make sense one day. And I guess that's that old, that's that old story of, you know, one door closes and another mm. one opens and, you know, cream always rises to the yeah. top. And there are all those sayings that basically says, look, you know, what is a hurdle now will become a stepping mm. stone and, and you know, I just have to think that. I have to think that maybe, uh, maybe yeah. there's greater things to do and better yeah, things to yeah. do. And no, no, look, it's all very sad. Yeah. And I feel so sorry for the patients because I know that I can help them. Yeah. Uh, but one thing, can you tell me about hope? 
because obviously people, oh. some people say false hope. But tell me, Mark, if I could just, <laughs> I just want to look from a from that point of view though, because I'm thinking, is it false hope if you can prolong someone's life? Because I, obviously, with these brain cancers, it's inevitable Again. what the outcome is going to be. Yeah, yeah look, but, look, if you're a Charlie Teo yeah. detractor, then they're accusing me of false hope. Now, what yeah. does that mean? Okay, yeah. so this is what it means. There is no such thing as false hope. Hmm. Hope is something that we all hold on to on a daily basis. I mean, you've got to hope that you're alive next, the next day if you want to, uh, if you want to go to bed yep. at peace. You've got to hope that uh, you can cross the road without being killed. There's no such thing as false hope. Hmm. We all have hope, and our hope is what drives us on a daily basis to live our lives. What they're talking about is false promises from doctors to give people hope. Mm. And I 100% agree with that. Mm. I think it's incumbent on a surgeon or a doctor not to give false promises mm. so that people can either cling on to hope or let go of hope. It's up to them as long as you inform them properly. Mm. So they're accusing me of giving false promises. They're saying that TO operates on tumors that no one can operate on, no one should be operating mm. on, and he's doing it for money or he's doing it for glory or, you know, whatever they accuse mm. me of. So they've, they've misworded it essentially mm. uh, right. because no one, no one believes in false. There's no such thing as false hope. Yeah. There's only, you know, false yep. promises. Yeah. yeah. So where you're at at the moment, it's not allowing you to do what you do here, but you still have your foundation, the Charlie T.O. Foundation. Yes. Raising money to do what? This is the funny thing about my life that everyone, th you know, I'm lauded and celebrated as this great doctor. Mm. I'm not a great doctor. I do what all doctors should do. Mm. Give their patients respect, believe yep. in patient autonomy, mm. have a responsibility to, to be the best you can be for them. And if you're not the best, refer them to someone who is, who's mm. better than you. Mm. And uh, so when they... When they say to me, oh, you're a great doctor, I'm not a great doctor. I'm a, I'm a do what good doctors ought to do. When it comes to the Charlie T.O. Foundation, it's the same mm. sort of thing. I'm not some fantastic hero who's raised $51 million. All I am is a doctor who goes, oh, shit, you've got brain cancer. I can give you a year, but wouldn't it be great if I can cure you? Mm. And if I can't do it, my job is to find someone who can. Mm. So raising money for brain cancer research was a given. It was almost mm. like, how could you not? Mm. If you don't do that, you I don't think you're giving you, you, you're shirking your responsibility to the patient. The patient comes to you with brain cancer. You take it out. You can't wash your hands of it and say, yeah. you know, okay, next person. Yeah. I think it's incumbent on the surgeon to go, it's now my responsibility to make mm. sure that you have the appropriate care to keep you alive for as long as possible or to cure you. And if the oncologist can't do that and the radiation oncologist mm. can't do that, then it's my job to try and find something that can. So it was natural for me to raise money. I mean, I, I think all doctors should be doing it. And I don't know why doctors feel like they can just wash their hands of their patients and, and dis discard the responsibility just because they've done their bit. Yeah. Uh, so raising money, the Charlie Teo Foundation, I think, is something that Every doctor should have their own foundation yeah, <laughs> to try yeah, and either yeah. stop disease or, you know, improve yeah. outcomes from yeah. disease. As there are all these medical advances, do you honestly believe a cure for cancer can be found? Oh, my God, yes. Definitely? Definitely. Really? Yeah, That's no, good. no doubt. No doubt. That makes me feel good because inevitably, yeah. you know, if it's not you, it's someone you know is suffering from cancer, so yeah. it can happen. Oh, my God, yes. No, you should be very optimistic about finding cures for cancer. Look at leukemia. Yep. When I was a medical student, we were taught that leukemia killed most people. You know, I forget what the figures were, but let's say 70, 80, 90% of people would die from leukemia. That was over, you know, God, how old am I? So it was about 45 years, years ago. Mm. Now it's the opposite. Most people survive leukemia. Mm. It's, uh, I think it's got about a 5 to 10% uh, mortality rate. So it, it's flipped completely. And that's only through research, yep. awareness, funding, and smart minds saying, you know, and, and uh, sort of jumping hurdles and, and having great ideas. There's no reason why you can't take all those factors that found a cure for mm. leukemia and put it into any other cancer and find. Mm. 
you know, it's, and that's why it's important because they say it's about $50 billion in 50 years to find a cure for a particular type of cancer. Right. So my job is to raise $50 billion and live for another few more years uh, to find <laughs> yeah. a cure for brain cancer. Yeah. Every single person listening now has a phone. And is it myth? Is it some sort of, uh, I suppose, research and fact behind the fact, are these phones going to cause us all sorts of problems down the track? No. The good news is no. Yeah. But the bad news is, yes, they probably have some, there's probably some merit to the association between brain cancer and mobile phones. I used to be ridiculed by my colleagues for making that statement. Mm. And I can remember the particular neurosurgeon in Queensland who got on public radio and, and mocked me and giggled and laughed like a child, a petulant child saying, oh, T.O.'s an alarmist. Ha, 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 how dare he say mm. something like that. I'm pleased to say I've got the last laugh because it's not just me now. The International Agency for research into cancer, sanctioned and mandated by the WHO, mm -hmm. came out with a statement saying that mobile phones are potential carcinogens, level 2B, right. which means that they, there is enough evidence in the literature to say, listen, these things could be causing brain cancer and we should at least continue research or at least warn the public that they shouldn't be holding them next to their brains. Yeah. Right. So it's I, not just me anymore. I know when I've spoken on the phone for ages, your ear gets warm. Your yeah. head gets warm. I've, I think I've had headaches. I don't know if I've talked myself into having a headache, no, but no. I think I've had headaches from being on a phone for 40 minutes. Oh, no, absolutely. Generates a thermal energy. It absolutely does. And, and, and the theory against mobile phones was that thermal energy doesn't create uh, breaks in DNA. Mm. But they've shown now that, in fact, there are other factors in mobile phones and the electromagnetic radiation emitted by phones that causes DNA mutations mm. and, and, and breakages. And so the good news, however, is that it's near-field radiation. And that means, means it means that if you hold your phone more than one arm's length away from your head, yeah. it uh, almost completely excludes that uh, that risk. Oh, yeah. so you use hands free. So hands free. Yep. Don't don't leave it next to your head when you go oh, to bed at night. Don't stick it yeah. under your pillow. Yeah. Because remember, when the phone is turned off, it's not turned off. It yep. it sends out signals every six to eight seconds to the base, telling that where you know, telling base yep. where it is and stuff. Yeah. So, it, just because you're not talking on it doesn't mean it's not emitting yep. electromagnetic radiation. Yep. Yeah. Charlie, looking forward, obviously you've got to wait to see what happens with with everything. Are you optimistic about your future? Look, this is, this is going to sound incredibly self-serving and a bit show off mm. but I love helping people. That's what mm. I, I love doing. I've done it all my life, and I can't imagine life without helping others. You know, it sounds like I'm saying I'm a great guy, but... No, no, it's not. It's you like know, you're saying that you that, want to my, help yeah. people. Yeah, that's my, that's yeah. my thing. Yeah. Other people like making money. Other yeah. people like sort of helping mm. themselves. I like helping mm. people. It's, well, everyone but, should have a reasonable size element of that in them anyway, shouldn't they, to want to help other people? You would oh, bloody no, hope. Some, some people don't have I know they don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you would hope in humanity that everyone yeah, sure. certainly has a reasonable amount of that in them. Yeah. So, look, I've still got that urge. I've got an amazing urge to help. And if I can't help Australians, then, you know, I'm going to go overseas and help mm. overseas people. And if I can't continue practising neurosurgery, then I'll help them in some other way. Mm. I'm developing some software now that can map the human brain and diagnose conditions like depression and anxiety and right. PTSD and schizophrenia, yes. autism, all those yeah. things that had a normal structural MRI scan, yep. those people actually have abnormal functional scans. Right. And we can see that now. So traditionally you, you obviously couldn't tell with no. mental health. And no, the poor things, old psychiatrist would see a patient with melancholia yep. and go, I think you're depressed, but there was no blood test to show right. depression yep. and there was no imaging test to show depression, but we've got that now. And that, that technology was, was developed in Australia yep. by a very smart guy who used to be a neurosurgeon, and it's being used to treat people with mental health conditions, those, those maps of the brain, mm. uh, because you can modify some of the networks of the brain using all sorts of mm. non-invasive technologies like transcranial magnetic stimulation, 
direct current stimulation. These things can modify networks. And the reason we weren't using them effectively before is because we didn't know where the networks were abnormal. So we this is essentially networks. targeted magnetic type. Targeted, navigated magnetic fields influencing electrical fields in the brain to help mental health conditions. And you don't have to go in to do it. You don't have to go in to do it. Really? Yeah. So I'm I'm really enjoying that. So if they stop me from operating and mm. it looks like they well they've succeeded so far, mm. uh, then hopefully I can continue helping people in other ways. Yeah. Charlie, for all of the people, some are sceptical, and it sounds like there are a lot from the medical profession, um, and many, many aren't because you've looked after them and, and provided wonderful benefits for them. What's your message to society now, given that all this is going on in your life, if you could say something to Australia generally, what, what would it be? Oh, I know exactly what to say because I was fortunate enough to have lunch with the Dalai Lama. Right. Yeah. So you're hanging around with gurus over there and now the Dalai Lama as well. Well, the Dalai Lama was something very special. I had four hours with him. Right. During lunch and after lunch, one-on-one -on -one with the Dalai Lama. How many people can say that? Is there an aura? About what, what? No. Tell me about no, the, there isn't. what happens when you meet the Dalai Lama. He's a great guy. He's just like a great guy who tells terrible dad jokes. <laughs> uh, he's very wise. He's been around for a long time. He's very pensive. And very. Yeah. Um, he, he can't verbalize his thoughts very well. He has, he's got assistant lamas that sort of come around and sort of right. translate for him. But you can see that his brain is, you know, working at a, Thousand miles an hour, trying to get out his message. It's just that his English wasn't so good. But, right. but uh, so I, 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 I spent, you know, all this time with him talking about the meaning of life. And did uh, he give you an answer? Yeah, he did. Yeah. <laughs> Are you happy to share it with yeah, us? Yeah, I'll share it with you. <laughs> right. He, he goes, "What is it in life that we need more of? What What does the world need more of?" And I thought, love. Mm. You know, the first mm. thing I said was love, and he goes, "No." He goes. There are people in this world who love killing and there are people in this world who love, you know, uh, hurting animals. We don't need love. Oh, that's why it's a Dalai Lama because he's thinking outside the square yeah. now, isn't he? He goes, we need kindness. Yeah. He goes, you can never get too much kindness. Mm. And I think to all those people out there trying to destroy me, show a bit of kindness. <laughs> uh, no, I think kindness. Uh, yeah. The world is lacking kindness. You think about what's happening today in Australia. Now, there's road rage, we all accept that, yeah. but now there's street rage, mm. office rage, and God damn it, there's surf rage. Yeah. Now, what is going on in our world that the iconic Australian surfer, who's meant to be a dude, you know, he's meant to be mm. chilled and relaxed, and she'll be right, mate. If someone's cutting your wave. If they're cutting Jeez. in their wave, they get all angry. Mm. They get angry, and they, they sometimes actually try and, you know, oh, I can imagine there'd be punch-ons out in the water. Punch, punch no doubt. and stuff like that. Yeah. But now, it's a good point with kindness because there's something wrong in the world where we can't show simple kindness. Everyone seems angry and negative. Yeah. There's a real, real, I think, general feel yeah. that people are angry, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. People, I'm, I'm guilty of it too. I'm yeah. not saying that I'm the, you know, yeah. on the road, I get a bit of road rage sometimes. Mm. And, but I do, at least I check myself and I go, gee, Charlie, you know, you're getting angry at that person. Mm. For all we know, that person might have had their father die today and they've mm. distracted and they've pulled in front of you and you're getting angry with yeah. them. Yeah. Just show a bit of kindness. Yes. Show a, bit, show a bit of kindness. Yeah. I was listening to this podcast the other day and they're talking about, I think it was a generous assumptions, I think they called it. So exactly like what you said, where if someone cuts off, cuts you off, instead of turning around going, you stupid prick, yeah. you turn around and go, right, what's the worst thing that could have happened to that person? Yeah. Are they rushing off to the hospital to visit their dad or something? Yeah. But if you make that generous assumption, it changes your perspective for everything. So yeah. Everything you get angry at, what are you angry at? Why? Well, make a generous assumption as to why that incident happened. And then suddenly your whole mindset changes, Yeah, yeah. which is quite a simple process, yeah. but it seems like it's quite effective. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I even get upset when, you know, when you let someone in and they don't thank you. Yes. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Where's the, yeah, where's the, where's the courtesy? Up? Where's the courtesy? You know, absolutely. I just, I just, you know, and, and then you think, well, hang on, when I'm distracted and I'm thinking about something else, I forget to thank someone. And so you're right. You just got to, you got to try and show a bit more kindness and consideration and courtesy. And I need to warn you while you're here in Adelaide, 
do not drive a car if you are worried about people not giving way or right, acknowledging right. you, letting them in. Because uh, I can say this, I've lived here for 30 years. I'm from Melbourne originally. Worst drivers in Australia here in Adelaide. <laughs> Mark. No, I can say that. There is no doubt. And no, I'm sure that many no, get out. many South Australians would agree with me. No, they're pretty discourteous <laughs> in Sydney. Are they? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. more there's more horn work in Sydney, no doubt. Like oh, New York, obviously, you know, angry. when you walk through there and you just hear all the horns. We don't hear a lot of horns here. Charlie Teo, yeah. thank you so much for joining me, mate. It's been an absolute treat. And I could sit there and talk to you for hours because the fact that you have the skills to go into someone's head and work on their brain, the thing that makes them, I think, is is quite amazing. Um, and I wish you all the very best over uh, the next couple of years with everything you're dealing with. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate you being here. And I think everyone listening in, it's just fascinating to be able to pick the brain, pardon the pun of it, talking about brains, <laughs> with someone like you. And I do love the fact now that uh, my two boys who love their Lego – I will make sure that there are no donuts and no soft drinks when they're playing with their Lego in the next couple of days. <laughs> exactly, <okay>? yeah. <laughs> Charlie, thanks so okay, much for no, joining pleasure. us. Thank you. Thanks very much. Well, guys, thanks so much for listening. Now, if you love what you just heard, please subscribe to the Soda Room podcast. You could write a review. Uh, you can watch the show on YouTube and share it with your buddies. And if you'd like to get in touch with the show, drop us a line, info at thesodaroom.com. Catch you soon. Catch you soon.